Unemployment is not a new problem to the Easter Ross. In the 18th century, General Sir Hector Munro, an old Indian Army man, pitied the plight of the Highlanders and gave them public work to do. For a penny a day, they carried stones up Firish Hill to build a replica of the gates of Negapatan. Across the south of Cromarty, in January 1972, a new project commenced, which was to pay far more than the modern equivalent of a penny a day to the latter-day unemployed. It was to make them craftsmen, who would be trained in the new Highlands Fabricators Training School. Craftsmen with a stake in an expanding industry. The start of excavation to remove one and a half million cubic yards of sand and sandstone. The dredging of a quarter of a million cubic yards of materials. And all this to construct a new graving dock would be no mean effort under normal circumstances. But considering that the target date was only seven months away when the first cut was made in these sand dunes, then it became a formidable task. However, when work started in January 1972, there was every reason to believe that with the equipment to hand, the target date would be met. And it was. Here then, in September 1972, is the fabrication yard of Highlands Fabricators Limited. The offices, the fabrication shops, and beyond, the Great Hole of Make, as it is locally known. Together, these make up one of the largest fabrication spreads in the world for offshore structures, here on this peninsula on the coast of northeast Scotland. A remarkable achievement. A graving dock, 1,000 feet long by 500 feet wide and 50 feet deep. In the days of the old giant Atlantic liners, you could have floated several of them in a hole of this size. But this dock is not for liners. It's for the construction of oil drilling and production platforms. The first job is to construct the legs for one of the world's biggest offshore platforms. It will stand on the British petroleum strike on the Fortis field, just off the Scottish coast. The company chose this location for its proximity to the oil field and also for the all-important water depth in which to float the structures to be built. However, the site lacked one thing. In January 1972, there was no local skilled labor force. In November 1972, there is a local skilled labor force. A force of over 600 men capable of handling the work of assembling complex steel structures. But to say that there was no skilled labor force in the January seems like denying Newcastle its coal or Texas its oil. Scotland was one of the birthplaces of the Industrial Revolution. But the concentration of that traditional labor force and industry was 200 miles further south in the cities and towns of the Scottish Central Lowlands. This new site is further north than heavy industry has ever been in Scotland before. It is a land of farmers in a particularly fertile pocket of land. It's on a seaboard once noted for white fishing, but now its activity is confined to a small, profitable sea salmon trade and to pleasure boating. Recent years have seen relatively little industrial development. Hydroelectric plants and an aluminium smelter gave work in quantity only during their construction. The other wide-famed industry satisfies the demand of the many out of the efforts of a few. The tremendous task of creating these huge facilities had been the responsibility of the British firm Wimpy, one of the two parent companies in Highlands Fabricators. One could say, they left no stone unturned. In human terms, their American partners Brown and Root had an equally vast task in creating the labor force to run that yard. Were they to import a labor force from further south? Impossible. The housing problem alone would have ruled it out. The importation of American labor in numbers was not considered. It is company policy to recruit and train in the locality. The company
Shirley was sure that the reputation of the Highlanders was such that if given the opportunity, they could provide the labor force needed. 600 men such as these were registered as unemployed in the area. Most of the potential recruits had had no experience of steel fabrication, and the work which lay ahead of them would put them in the big league. Public meetings were organized throughout the area to explain the details of the proposed fabrication yard. Some people were naturally concerned. There had been full employment in the area twice before. Temporarily, in two world wars, this windswept harbor had been a naval base for the home fleet. After each war, the ships had gone, leaving only the odd supply ship and a lot of empty pockets. Most people were very definitely in favor of new opportunities for employment. But there were doubts in the minds of some on a number of other factors, environmental matters, pollution risks, possible unsightliness. At the meetings with hot cups of tea, the developer's task was not quite so hard as when they toured the crafts alongside the proposed site in a biting January wind. The local attitude and their final acceptance of the situation was summed up by Eric Linklate of the offer, who lived in the big house on the hill slope above, and upon whose land the major part of the site was to be built. We've been living here for just over 25 years, and we've grown very, very attached to this part of the world. It's a very beautiful part of Scotland, and um, I leave here with real regret, with real sorrow, but one has learned that the overwhelming need for all these highland parts is employment. The country is running down, too few people, and uh, much though one regrets, in, from a purely selfish point of view, much though one regrets uh, the necessity, one realizes that 98.6% of people want this thing to happen, and uh, you've got to abide by the will of a majority when the majority is as big as that. I've been assured uh, that for this type of industry, there is no risk of pollution whatever. Well, one is very, very glad indeed to hear that. Across the fell at Invergordon, the British aluminium plant was landscaped. And the Highlands Fabricator site, too, will be screened with trees along a perimeter mound, and the fabrication shops painted to merge with the background. Certainly, from close quarters, the structures will be an improvement on what was there before. A decrepit pier and a large old building still bearing wartime camouflage. Despite use as a potato store, nature was in the process of reclaiming the old Admiralty Yard when Highland fabricators took over to set up their training school. One of the old blockhouses would become a rigging loft, another a warehouse. The large, old building, now the habitat of flocks of sparrows, would accommodate the trainee welder. The theory classes would need new accommodation in a prefabricated building. It all had to be ready by April 1972 to start the first intake of trainees. But first, they briefed the small group of newly arrived American instructors. Fellas, I'd like to welcome you to Nig Scotland. I'm Keith Trainer, being a training manager while we're training the local people. There's a high unemployment rate in the local area, and we're going to train several different crafts. Most of you here today are going to be our rigging instructors. We've got a program outlined. Classes are going to be going for five weeks, meaning six days a week, eight hours a day. The trainees, the local people, are a good group of people. They want to work. They want to learn a trade, and that's what we're here to do. These Americans have been selected in Houston by Brown and Root's training department, the department used to providing training facilities for projects in all parts of the world. Here at Nick, they were to train the first work crews recruited from local men of various backgrounds, who are now either unemployed or seeking good work in their home locality. Well, I was 10 years in the Royal Navy, and I'm out of the Navy approximately 10 years, and since leaving the Navy, I've had numerous jobs none with anything which could be called security. And I've, I've done rigging before, which I'm learning to be here, incidentally. I'm learning to be a, a rigger. Training local labor involved making teams of men into welders, riggers, fitters, and other crafts involved in fabrication work. 
The welding process is taught included stick rod, mig, submerged arc, and inner shield. The exercise started in the classroom. This two foot nine dimension that is illustrated right here means that it comes from this point to your working point here is two foot nine in this direction as well in this direction here is two foot nine because it's given by this and by that there. Does that answer your question? The training program was carefully phased to provide the manpower needed at the fabrication yard. After spending five weeks in the training shop, followed by three or four weeks in the field, some of the trainees were taken back into the training shop as assistant instructors. The idea of the men being taught by their colleagues is a part of the company's training policy. The students feel at ease in that they are with their own kind. There is also the saying that the student makes the best teacher. A lot of thought, planning and money have been put into the training scheme. The welding machines, cutting machines, and a seemingly endless supply of raw materials on which to exercise growing skills. In the welding school, trainees are accommodated in 44 cubicles. But all the units and all these cubicles, they are really equipped for all three phases, all three te techniques. The two units together can, can do all three phases of welding. It's just a matter of, of switching on or turning off two switches one way or the other. Changing over from one to the other is just a matter of minutes. And to make the training more realistic, many of the practical exercises led to the making of training and construction aids, both in the workshop and in the yard. Those when they built a small 30-foot structure for the rigging program. Uh, they drew it up on blueprints, uh, they went out in the shop, laid it out, the welding class welded it up for them, and uh, they've now turned it over the riggers to erect. It's a practical project, it gives the boys something to work on that's meaningful to them. Exercises of this kind and touches, such as this model, are part of the policy of humanizing the scheme. Men are shown their target, given a pride in it and in themselves. While everyone has a works number, the fact is not forgotten that he also has a name, and it is used on every man's hat and on every welder's cubicle. If you were a supervisor with troubles, you no troubles. He starts having fun. It's one of the few jobs you know you should have done. If anybody wants anything, they come and ask. The company treats every man as an individual, and we had the boys in the other day talking to them about their welding. They were getting a little concerned about their certification test that if they didn't do very well on it the first time, we were going to run them off. And we sit them down and explain to them you know, really the philosophy of the company. We look at all the problems they've got and try to solve those problems on an individual basis. And that's what's making this training school go. And that's what's going to make it a success. On completion, the trainee is awarded a certificate. It's almost basic uh, human nature to want to have something around to show that you've done a good job. I've been to several of the men's houses, uh, and, you know, they're, they're on the wall. The award is not automatic. Each trainee has to pass the client's stringent test. You know, the welding on this job's got to be of the very highest standard. But no man is lightly discarded or downgraded. Initial aptitude tests gave a 95% assurance that each of these men would graduate in the craft for which he had been selected. Those who failed at the first attempt needed only two or three extra weeks in the training shop to consolidate before retesting successfully. This second chance helps build confidence and creates enthusiasm. The thing I noticed is not only are they keen here, but they're taking work home. I mean, they're taking homework home with them. Maths, for example, there's a couple of boys in the rigging uh, school who, on the first maths class, probably knew a thing. Because they left school, what, 12, 13, when they were, you know, 12, 13, 14 years of age. And their maths, maths, the one fellow who had 20% on his first maths marks, I saw a math mark on today, 85%. And it's sheer hard work. He takes everything home with him every night and studies like crazy. Yeah, quite pleased with my position with the company and everything is just good, you know? I think they're quite satisfied, you know, they quite like the work and they're quite pleased with the money. Naturally, we all like to think we'll get a bit more, but really and truly, in my opinion, they're quite well off and they seem to be quite satisfied with the money, you know. 
The fabrication yard has trained and employs almost 95% of local labor. People come from the approximately 50 mile radius in this area. Most of personnel, or all personnel we employ and have no experience, previous experience in offshore platforms. We're rather pleased with the dedication and the output of these workers. Personally, I think it's going to be a very good job. The success of a venture of this kind can also be measured in the increased stability it gives to the locality. Well, for the north, I mean, the north is a floating community. It's here today and gone tomorrow. This could help them. Could stabilize them. Wives now have their men at home instead of away south working. Their jobs are now on the doorstep and they have spare time in the evenings and at weekends. 